This morning's scripture is from the third chapter of Acts. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, about three in the afternoon. Now a man who had been lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day so that he could beg from the people going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from him. But Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Peter reached down and took the man by his right hand to help him up. And immediately the man's feet and ankles became strong, and he jumped up and began to walk. And he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when the people saw him walking and jumping and praising God, they recognized him as the man who sat begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the wonderful word of God from long ago for all of us today. Thanks be to God. That's the beautiful gate right there on the screen. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the way that your Holy Spirit has been moving in our hearts and in this time of worship. I pray that you would continue to speak to us words of challenge and hope as we continue to hear the words you have for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of my favorite things is when we name animals human names. So, for example, did you know that at the uh, Columbus Zoo and Aquarium, there is a rhinoceros named Brian? <laughs> the next time you're sad, I just want you to think about the fact that somewhere in the world, there's a rhino named Brian, okay? I'm here to tell you a story about a sheep named Chris. There he is. He's a lot like other sheep in a lot of ways. He lives outside. He's a merino sheep. He ate grass, but there are lots of ways in which he was nothing like other sheep. I brought you another picture of Chris. There he is. 2015, Chris was found alone in the forest by hikers in the Canberra region of Australia, sporting wool more than twice his body weight. Now, did you know this, that wild sheep have the ability to naturally shed their wool seasonally? But domesticated sheep, like merino sheep, have wool that needs to be sheared off the body, usually annually. They need help to survive. Now, Chris was in pretty bad shape uh, when he was found. I brought you another picture. You can see him from a different angle. There he is. He was wool blind which is to say that the wool had grown so far over his eyes that he couldn't see anymore. And his heavy wool coat made it so that he could barely move around to find food. And he overheated in the summer, so he was dehydrated, and he was underweight, and he was malnourished. He had been like this, they guess, for about five years. This is five years' worth of wool. And when they found him, they guessed that he was just a few weeks from death until he was seen and rescued. So these hikers, they called an animal rescue agency, Little Oak Sanctuary, which promptly took him in and made a plan for his recovery. Now, merino sheep usually take about six minutes to shear. Uh, Little Oak contacted a guy in Australia who was the champion sheep shearer three years running. It took this dude 42 minutes to shear Chris, y'all. Chris. 
And when he was done, Chris was 89.2 pounds lighter. 89.2. He's a world Guinness Book of World Records holder. His wool went to a museum because that's what you do with five years of wool at once. And Chris stayed at Little Oak. And he lived there for four more years and died in 2019, four years longer than he would have lived otherwise. He lived a life that was happy with other animals in community with other animals who were rescued like him, no longer weighed down, no longer isolated and alone. His life had been restored. The story that we hear about from the book of Acts today is another restoration story, I think equally as impressive. So if you've not heard the story, maybe you just heard it for the first time, let's go over it again. So it's about Peter and John. These are two of Jesus' disciples. They've then been called to be leaders in the church in Jerusalem, and they're doing what devout Jews do. They're going to afternoon prayers in the temple, and something pretty common happens while they're on their way. They're passing through the gate, and they pass by a person who is in need of some help. So this particular person is a man um, who lays at the temple gate each and every day. The beautiful gate, it's called. You can, if you were looking at the picture, you could see why. It's very beautiful. And the scripture says that he is lame from birth. So as long as he has been alive, he's, he's had this inability to walk. To even get to the gate, he has to have other people carry him. And he has to do this to survive. Because he lives in a time and a place that misunderstands disability. Um, and that doesn't provide that kind of help to folks who experience that. So he has to rely on the abilities of others, the generosity of others, um, as they are going into the temple for worship. And so this is how he survives. Um, and he asks Peter and John for help, just like he asks everybody else. And he thinks he's got them for a moment because they look at him and they're about to respond. And so he thinks maybe they're going to give um, something monetary to him, at, but they don't give him what he expects. They don't have silver or gold. We read about in chapter two last week how they gave all that up for the good of community. But what they do have is a gift of healing. And so that's what Peter gives them. He says, through the Holy Spirit, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And Peter reaches out his hand and pulls this guy up, and his feet and his ankles are made strong, and he's strong enough to walk. And he doesn't just walk, as we heard from the scripture. He stands, he jumps up. He doesn't just get up, he jumps up. He begins to walk, he begins to leap. And can you imagine this person leaping? Do you all leap into worship on Sundays? Maybe we ought to from now on. Where does he go? He goes into the temple to praise God. And the folks inside recognize him, and they're filled with wonder and amazement at what they see. And so they praise God, too. Now, this is a pretty standard healing story. I don't know. You might have, have no experience with the Bible. You might be a Bible scholar. But if you read through this story, it's pretty standard. This is more or less the pattern that Jesus' healings follow. And now here are his followers doing what he did. Just like he called them to do when he gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit, they are picking up where he left off. And so the question that we ask ourselves, friends, as we read this text, as we read Acts all throughout the summer, the question we'll be asking in one way or another each and every Sunday is this question. Have we picked up where Jesus left off? Have you and I in the church here in 2023, has this church, has every church, have we picked up where Jesus left off? Is it even possible for us today to live and love and follow Jesus like the early church did? And if so, how on earth do we begin to do that? I'm here today, I guess this is a spoiler, I'm here today because I believe this is possible, and my guess is that many of you do too. That it's possible to live, if not exactly like the early church did, then to certainly live in ways that fit the original job description while also living in ways that are appropriate for today. We've been gifted the same Holy Spirit as the early church did. God doesn't change that way. We're still living under the love and the grace of God. And really, though, these are particular people in a particular circumstance in a particular place. The lessons that we get from the scripture here, they're pretty universal lessons. And so one of the universal lessons I think we are hearing from this text today, this is just one, there's lots of ways you could take it, right? One of the lessons I hear when I read this story is that one matters. 
one matters. One person matters to God. There's a story about sheep in the Bible. There's actually lots of stories about sheep in the Bible, but there's one that's one of my favorites, that Jesus tells a story about how God is like a shepherd with a hundred sheep who leaves the 99 sheep that he does have in the pursuit of the one that he has lost. That God seeks out, rejoices in its finding, restores it back to the flock. My friends, you and I, we are known and loved by a God who shepherds us, who loves us, all of us, and who loves each of us, who seek us out. A God who seeks us out one by one and heals us and restores us to community. Our God is a God of the one. One person matters to God. The restoration of each life matters. And that's what Peter and John are doing in this story. They're participating in God's acts of restoration. They're participating in the restoration of a life because one life matters. They notice him. Did you hear how they listen to his voice? They hear him asking for help. He's asking for help to continue living the kind of life he's been accustomed to living. And they give him something in return, but they don't give him what he expects. They give him what he actually needs, and that's healing. Even before he's able to make a confession of faith, even before he knows who Jesus is, he experiences healing at the hands of these friends. They treat him, they don't treat him like a problem. He's not a problem to be solved. They treat him like what he is, which is a human being. Do you see that there's eye contact? And that there are kind words exchanged? And there's a hand up, not a hand out, but a hand up. And they invite him in this whole process. They invite him into a new kind of life. It's a life that's possible through the power of Jesus. And at the end, he's restored into a community. And this, friends, this is what God does for us. God restores us to a full life with one another. And so this is what we're enabled by the Spirit to do for one another out of a profound sense of gratitude. Now, that's all well and good, isn't it? But what does it look like in practice, and how do I do that? Because, I don't know, maybe you are like me. I turn on the news, I get on social media, and what I am confronted with is the enormity of it all. I'm confronted with the enormity of it all. There are so many problems that I hear about and that I read about and I see, and problems that I experience in the world around me. There's lots of challenges out there. There are a lot of people whose lives are affected by these challenges. This man sitting at the beautiful gate, he's probably not the only one who was there that day. There were likely dozens of people just like him who had no other option available to them. And it's not that different than our life today. There aren't just one or two people sitting outside the proverbial gates of life. There are thousands. There are millions. There are even billions, we could say. In every place, in every person, there is a hurt. And so it's really easy to get caught up in the enormity of the challenges, to say things like, depression is a huge problem. It hurts so many. I'm just one person. Who am I? Up against something that's always going to be a problem. Mental health is a really hard thing to tackle. What can I do? Or poverty is a huge problem. It hurts so many, and yet I'm just one person. It, it's, it's, it's just too big of a problem. Who am I up against something that's always going to be a problem? Or discrimination in its many forms and, and in, in the lives of many people is a huge problem. And who am I? Have you ever said that to yourself? Who am I? It's too big. Who am I against something like this? It's easy to get overwhelmed by the amount of restoration that there is to do. And just to say, I'm just one. And in our overwhelm, there's temptation. There's temptation to look away. To ignore the needs that we see in front of us. And it's tempting not to engage. Tempting to not engage in the conversation. I'm sure that that is what a lot of folks who were passing into the temple did. Looked away and did nothing. Maybe it's tempting to throw money at the problem, to throw money at the problem, the people and the situations which we perceive to be challenges. Again, this is what we see lots of folks entering into the temple doing, giving their alms, nothing more. Because who has the knowledge, who has the time, who has the, the ability? It's really, really tempting to believe that real, true restoration, like the gift that Peter and John have. Most of all, this is the temptation we experience, tempting to believe that the power that they had 
is beyond us that it's beyond people like you and me, that it's not possible for us, we who live in 2023, living where we live, knowing what we know, it's impossible for us to participate in healing and restoration like they did. It's really tempting, isn't it? But I'm here to say, friends, that's not the life that Jesus has called us to. After his resurrection, when he sent the disciples out into the world, Jesus didn't say... Here's what I'm going to ask you to do, maybe, perhaps. Would you just go and look around and sort of see what's going on? And if you feel like it, maybe you could do one or two things. I don't know. Is that what you read in the Bible? <laughs> That's not what Jesus calls us to. Jesus says to the disciples, go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We're not powerless here. Remember that I am with you always, he continues, to the end of the age. And then he says in Acts, you will receive what? Who? The Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So, so God is at work in Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit here and now, even in this year, even in this moment, just as God was at work in Acts. It might look different. But it's no less present. Jesus doesn't establish the church and then keep on living through the church. We're not here to make life bearable for people. That's not the call. People who are encountering challenge and hurt and suffering, we're not here to make life bearable. We're here to release the redemptive work of the Holy Spirit into our communities and into our world. We're here to celebrate what God has done for us. We're here to treat people like people, to see them and to notice them where they are and to listen to their voices and to give them what they truly need and to invite them into something new. We are here to say yes to God's desire to offer life transformation through us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, how will we say yes? Alongside the knowledge that the challenge that we are agreeing to confront will remain. You know, those hikers who found that sheep said yes, and there were probably other sheep. I found some other sheep who had the same issue as Chris when I was doing research for this sermon. Other sheep literally remained weighed down, and yet that one sheep needed help. Peter and John say yes. There's other folks at the gate, and still this friend needed healed. So what they did was they focused on the one that they could help restore. You know, we just welcomed a team of students and adults from Messiah back from Redbird Mission in Appalachia. And they worked with one family in particular whose home needed repairs, a home that they couldn't repair all on their own. Our team said, yes, poverty is still going to exist in Appalachia and here in Columbus. And yet that family needed support. So our team helped in the way that they could. We're not going to be able to eliminate the challenges, but that doesn't mean that we don't engage in the work. The work to confront reality and to start to bring hope. We have to start somewhere, and we have to believe that the work that we do is good and holy and makes a difference no matter how many lives it affects, even if it affects only one. It's one. Each of us has the ability to offer restoration to another person in Jesus' name. That's the call. That's what we do together as a church. We're part of the church. And so we are part of the redemption business where the hikers finding the lost sheep, welcoming them into a safe place, into the sanctuary. We are the shearers, helping them to be relieved of all the burdens that they are carrying. We are the caretakers, helping them get back on their feet, giving them what they actually need. We are the ones on the lookout for people in all walks of life, in all places, anyone who has ever had to sit outside for any reason, we are the ones who offer words of healing and hope. And then we sit back and we watch for what God is going to do next. We listen to the call that God has given the church. We respond to the call and then we leave the rest up to God. And we see at the end of the text what that rest is, that what God does to transform a community, God's power restores one life. And then it restores lives because that man leaps up, he goes into the temple, and his healing provokes wonder in the lives of everybody else who was there for worship that day. 
you read a little bit further in the story, you'll see that the crowd rushes to Peter and John, and, and they, say, they ask him to tell the story, and what he tells them, what Peter says to them is, this is just the beginning. This restoration is just the beginning of the story that God has restoration plans for all of you and for all of Israel and for all people. What God has done in the life of this one, God will do elsewhere in the lives of many. The Talmud is a collection of teachings and laws from the rabbinic tradition of Judaism. And one of the beautiful things that it teaches is that whoever saves a single life is considered by scripture to have saved the whole world. Whoever saves, saves a single life has saved the whole world. And that's true. Because when one life changes, a community changes. And when a community changes, lives change. And when lives change, the world changes. So who is sitting at the gate who is it that God wants to welcome in? Who is your one? Thanks be to God.